This is Cthonia, the world of the dark feminine. Hello and welcome to Cthonia, the podcast dealing with the dark feminine. I'm your host, Breach Burke. This week we are going to look at a figure of Norse mythology known as Gefjon. Uh, Gefjon is considered to be part of the Aesir, which is the, the uh, main pantheon of Norse gods. Um, she is only mentioned in a few places, but there is one central myth that um, is connected to the creation of Denmark as an island that is connected to Gefjon. Now, uh, I want to start this uh, episode by talking by reading from the, the snippets from the different Eddas that tell us the, the story of Gefion. And then I want to get into, you know, we'll, we'll, t- we'll tell the stories first. And then I want to talk about, um, you know, it, I, I have some, some research that I've done from um, the Encyclopedia Handbook of Norse Mythology that talks a little bit about her and her associations. And, and there's some questions that's ra- that are raised in that particular um, piece on Gefion that I, I would like to discuss as, uh, as trying to understand the story of Gefion um, as, you know, as it fits in not only with other mythologies, but, but fits in with her, her symbolism and her importance and what the stories about her may represent other than, other than what might be considered the obvious. So... So the first thing I would like to talk about is uh, the mentions of Gefion in mythology. Now, Gefion's obviously, well, okay, maybe not obviously. In in many, she's interpreted as being a goddess, but there are other sources that maybe interpret her as being some other kind of force other than a goddess. And she has connections to, uh, to the goddess Freya, or Frigga, who is a love goddess, um, and that may well be because her name comes from the, uh, there's a Norse word, uh, geffa. Uh, it's a Norse verb that means to give. So there's this association of her uh, with giving or generosity. In fact, it's said that in Beowulf, uh, there's some mentions to a gefjon in, in Beowulf or, or an equivalent or similarly rooted term that may actually, that, that refer to her as a goddess of the sea or as it being connected to the sea assuming that that's what the Beowulf author is is talking about. But so, and again, the idea of the sea as being giving. And if you consider the, you know, the, the cultures, you have to always consider the, the culture in the background, just as we discussed with the Inuit and with Sedna. Uh, she's a goddess of the sea and the underworld that would, had gained a lot of importance because she was the one that released the sea mammals that could then be, um, you know, hunted by, by the Inuit. So <clears throat> there was a special importance there, you know, connected to the very livelihood. And similarly here, I think we are looking at a goddess of, uh, you know, of generosity uh, and abundance that is associated with um, the, the livelihood and the, and the survival of people from these particular areas, particularly we're looking at Sweden and Denmark here. So let's start with the poetic Edda. I'm just going to read uh, one translation here of the stanzas. It's, uh, she says she appears slowly in the three stanzas of the poem Loka Senna, where an exchange occurs between Gefion and Loki. And so in one of them, so Gefion questions why Loki, with his actions, wants to bring negativity into the hall with the gods. She says, uh, there's two different um, translations given here with two different endings. In one, the Benjamin Thorpe translation why will ye, Acer Twain, here within strive with reproachful words? Um, Loki, Loki perceives not that he is deluded and is urged on by fate. Okay, so this is this is meant to be um, a reproach to, to Loki, but this is interesting that, that he uh, translates it as urged on by fate. Now, the Henry Adams Bellows translation says, you know, this is Gefian speaking, Why ye gods, Twain, with bitter tongues, raise hate among us here? Loki is famed for his mockery foul, and the dwellers in heaven he hates. Uh, now, if you look at the two of them together, there may be a sense that she's simply saying that Loki is the type of a god that, um, you know, it, it's, it's part of his nature, like urged on by fate. It's part of his nature to make trouble, okay? That that could be, 
you know, the, the connection there. However, Loki responds to Gephian. Be silent, Gephian, for now shall I say, who led thee to an evil life? The boy so fair gave a necklace bright, and about him thy leg was laid. Now that was the Thorpe uh, translation. Oh, I'm sorry, the Bellows translation. The, the Thorpe translation um, gives it more of a sense that this was somebody t- you know, trying to suggest she was having a tryst or having sex with this, with this boy. And it's in, that's understood in the context of the fact that uh, Gephion is said to be a virgin goddess. Okay, uh, Something that doesn't entirely make sense if you, when we hear the rest of the stories about her, but, um, but I think there's a thing that ties this all together. So we'll get there. Okay. So that's the mention of her. Odin actually interject, interjects at the end of this and says to Loki, Mad art thou, Loki, and of little whip the wrath of Gephion to rouse. For the fate that is set for all she sees, even as I, me, thinks. So, in other words, he's saying that Gephion knows the fate of all mankind, and Loki is, um, is wrong to trifle with her or to try to anger her. And by insinuating he's, she's not a virgin is something that could rouse her to wrath or to anger. Okay, so that's the mention in the Poetic Edda. In the Prose Edda, there's, this is the story of King Gilfi. Okay, now... Here's, here's at least one translation from uh, Bragi Bodison. Bo- uh, Gephion dragged from Gifli, gladly the land beyond value. Denmark's increase, steam rising from the swift-footed bulls. The oxen bore eight moons, or eight stars, of the forehead and four heads, hauling as they went in front the grassy isle's wide fissure. Okay. So, <clears throat> some explanation of what that means in a minute. In chapter 5 of the Yingling Saga, in the uh, Heimskringla, it uh, says that Odin set Gephion from Odense, north over the Sound, to seek for land. There Gephion encountered King Gifli, and he gave her plow land. Now, depending on the version, sometimes uh, she appears to him as a homeless woman, to, to King Gifli, as a homeless woman, whom he then generously grants as much land as uh, can be plowed, and depending on the version, sometimes it says in one day, others in one day and one night. So, um, so she receives this plow land, and then she goes. It says here that she goes to the land of Jotunheimer, and there bore four sons to a Jotun who, who or a giant. Uh, Gephion transformed these four sons into oxen, attached them to a plow, and drew forth the land westward, westward of the sea, opposite to Odense. Uh, the saga, saga adds that this land is now called Selin, and that Gephion married um, Skuld, who is described here as a son of Odin. And uh, so, you know, so she marries the king, and this, this king who is the son of Odin, and supposedly she is the head of the lineage of the Swedish kings, that they all take their lineage from um, uh, Gephion. So it says, where Gephion took the land that formed Zealand, a lake was left behind called Logren, and the saga posits that it is the, it, it cor- the, bay, the bays in the lake Logren correspond to the nesses of Zealand. So in other words, you can, you can see almost like a cutout outline of the island of Zealand, which is where Copenhagen is now in Denmark, uh, that that is, you know, it, it's cut out from this particular lake. So that's, that's very interesting. So, okay. Now, it's mentioned here um, in the Wikipedia thing, they did some of the theoretical stuff about Gephion. It says, A recurring theme in legend and folktale consists of a man, or more often a woman, challenged to gain as much land as can be traveled within a limited amount of time. The motif is attest- attested by Livy around the 1st century CE, 5th century BCE Greek historian Herodotus, and in folktales from Northern Europe. In six tales from Jutland, Yen- Denmark, and one from Germany, a plow is used similarly as in Livy's account, though the conditions are often met by walking or riding. Um, <clears throat> Hilda Ellis Davidson points out a tale from Iceland that features a, fe- features a female settler whose husband had died on the voyage out, establishing her claim to a piece of land by driving young heifer around it. Okay. And, uh, and of course, it's... Uh, so, there's, so there's some other ones. There's, there's other similar ones. They also refer to Lady of the Lake tale, where... Um, there's a folk tale from the 19th century from Wales that says the lady brings forth a herd of wondrous cattle from the water after she consents to marrying a local farmer. Years later, he unwittingly breaks the conditions she laid down, as they always do. As a result, the lady returns to her dwelling beneath the lake and calls for her cattle to accompany her. 
um, calling them by name. In one version of the tale, the lady calls forth four gray oxen who were plowing in a field six miles away. Responding to her call, the oxen dragged the plow with them, and the gash in the land was said to have once been clearly visible. So, the, you know, this is not, this is, a, the, the, the point here being is that this is a motif. This is something that you see of the idea of the woman who is drawing out the boundary of the land. And in this particular case, uh, picking up and moving it. Now, there may be a connection to the whole concept of sovereignty there. We're not saying, we're not, I don't want to go as, to far as, as far as to say she's another sovereignty goddess. Although, very clearly, uh, Gephion does appear to be a land goddess, okay, from her, her way. And, and, and one that will be associated with fertility and abundance, um, but she's also associated with virginity. And in fact, it is said that young virgins who die become attendants of Gephion. All right. Uh, so I want to talk about um, an, uh, a couple other attributes. I'm going to go back to this article that I have from the Handbook of Norse Mythology on Gephion. And it says that Snorri lists Gephion fourth in the catalog in his um, Gilfaginning of Goddesses among the Aesir, and says she's a virgin served by women who die unmarried. Uh, Snorri also numbers her among the goddesses at Aegir's party at the beginning of, um, you know, the the um, poetic Edda, the one that I had just discussed when she has her argument with Loki. And she says, and then he goes on to talk about the most intriguing, intriguing Gephion story, which is the one that I just told you about um, her taking away the, uh, you know, uh, taking that piece of land and making it into the island of Zealand, uh, which is now um, Denmark. So he says, um, you know, Gilfi, the prehistoric Swedish king whose delusions at the hand of the Aesir make up the subject of this section of the Edda, had once given to a traveling woman as payment for his pleasure, that is payment to a prostitute, so you see there's a different inflection here, the land that she could plow up in a day and night using four oxen. That woman was Gephion the f- of the family of the Aesir. She took four oxen from the north out of uh, Jotunheimer, and those were the sons of, of a giant and her. And with their supernatural power, they plowed up an entire piece of land, took it west to a sound where they put it down. Gephion named it uh, Zeeland, uh, and now a, and a body of water was left behind in Sweden, Gilfi's realm called Logren. Uh, they're saying Lake Malarin, although now there's, there's other sources that say it's, it's a different lake. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, when Snorri told the story and quoted the verse in the Yinglinga saga, he said that Odin had just settled um, on the modern island of Odense, uh, and from there sent Gefion to look for the land, which we uh, spoke about. Now, the, the writer of this piece says, the varying conceptions are not easy to reconcile. We're faced with a prostitute who's said to be a virgin goddess and a goddess, virgin or not, who is said to have children with a giant, which should disqualify her as a goddess because the sexual traffic is all in the opposite direction. Um, well, that's interesting. So in other words, they're saying that the gods have to mate, you know, that the giants are the ones who have to give birth. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I agree with that assessment, but okay. In other words, there's these physical and mythological impossibilities. Well, that's only a physical impossibilities if Gephion isn't, isn't a deity. To me, when you're, when you're dealing in the realm of forces, nothing's an impossibility. Some of the inconsistencies recede if we understand Gephion as a figure of prehistory and a member of the Aesir, not in their roles as gods, but as what he calls Asia men, uh, as the Icelandic learned prehistory understood them and as Snorri presented them. So um, th- there's a sense here of them being, you know, these kind of uh, prototypical forces. Um, this Gephion had a clear association with Denmark, especially Zealand, if, even if no other texts support a marriage with Skuld, the founder of the Danish royal family in medieval Scandinavian tradition, and the Skildingas in Old English. Her interaction with the giants would have been on the order of other such human supernatural interactions. Uh, well, again, this is he, it's funny because he's assuming here that um, Gephion is human, and there really isn't any, um, any sense that she is although he may just simply be comparing it to other things like this. Um, so he says, however, many scholars persuaded that Gephion originally was a goddess. They believe her name has to do etymologically with gifts or giving and therefore might have been a fertility deity. Um, and it may have also be that her name was the source of a Finnish word meaning bride's outfit or trousseau. 
Uh, finally, in some translations, um, the translator, sub- sub- translator substituted the name of Gephion for a pagan Roman god or used it in a list of pagan Scandinavian gods when there was a list. Sometimes Diana is the Roman goddess in question, and that has led to the idea that Gephion split between virgin and whore may have originated an analogy with Diana. Now, <clears throat> okay. Now, the Diana link is the one that I find the most interesting here. Okay, Diana, as we know in the Roman, is Artemis. Now, I've done a podcast on Artemis, and it is worth um, thinking about that. For- the main story that we have here of Gephion is that she is she goes to this king uh, at Odin's request. The story of Loki is interesting because it, it, it suggests her as being connected with fates or knowing fate somehow. By the way, something else that we associate, at least in that part of the world, with goddesses of sovereignty or the land, that they also tend to have to do with prophecy and fate. Think of the Morrigan, for example, um, who is, in at least one of her roles, a goddess of sovereignty in the land and is known as a as one who does a prophecy. But, but see... Um, Prophecy and the Chthonic have always gone hand in hand in in many cultures. Um, the dead are said to be the ones who, you know, that that can tell you what the future are. So this idea of these underworld powers that that know everything about destiny. Okay. So there's you know so while Odin himself is not necessarily considered to be an underworld power, uh, and he claims he knows as much. Gephion knows as much as he does. There's kind of the suggestion there that there's a there's definitely a chthonic um, element to her. Okay, so let me move on to the story I want to tell you about. Um, let me just go to the top here. Okay, there's a story in um, the StarMythWorld.com uh, called Gephion and Her Plow, and I want to um, read a little bit about this here. Now, they mention the prose edda of Snorri uh, Sturluson from about the year 1179 to 1241. That's when, at least when Snorluson was said to be um, alive. And uh, so the edda was written somewhere in that time period, uh, which is about, what are we looking at, um, 12th or 13th century uh, CE. So there's the, there's the story of King Gilfi, which they tell again. Um... So the, the question is, okay, so in this myth, it says it's fairly easy to sort out. Clues are given in abundant, and the appearance in mythology of plowing by celestial oxen is well established, and refers to the familiar constellation of the Big Dipper in Ursa Major. The stars of the Big Dipper circle the North Celestial Pole, and they make a full circuit in a day and a night, that is, in 24 hours, due to the rotation of the Earth upon its axis. That is, the motion may correspond to the plowing in a circle of a piece of land by the goddess Gephion and her sons, it seems quite likely. Okay, so they mention some connections to um, some other works like the uh, Bhagavata Purana in India, and, you know, in which, you know, the, um, Prince Durva, uh, Druva is appointed as the pole star, and he stands on one leg and, and, and turns. Um, and so there's and there's a mention there of of oxen or oxen being driven around, uh, in that. So you know she makes that compa- they make that comparison. So here's the reasons that um, the Gephion myth might in this particular story of this picking up and moving of this land, and I'm going to read it from here, um, just you know so you know what my source is. Uh, StarMythWorld.com. So first, they say, is mentioned that Gifli promises Gephion as much land as four oxen can plow up in a day and a night. Now, again, in the story, she turns, you know, these are her sons by the giants that she turns into oxen. Uh, She's not offered as much as could be plowed in a single day or a single night, but as much could be plowed in a day and a night. And the dipper makes a full circuit as the earth makes its full circuit, and it thus cannot be said to plow a complete ring of space until a whole day and night have passed. Um, And neither then could Gephion and her sons. Second, we're specifically told that Gephion took four oxen from the north, who also happened to be her sons, fathered by a Jotun. Uh, of course, the constellation of the Big Dipper is associated with the north, circling closely as it does to the north celestial pole. Finally, as it's been noted, Snorri chooses to cite a snippet from an older poem in those lines which he chooses to quote, which I quoted in the other one, the oxen wore eight brow stars. Now, in the other one, they said moon, moons, eight brow stars as they went hauling their plunder. And as she says, this is interesting, the oxen are described as wearing stars as they perform their labor. 
Further, the stars are described as being eight in number. Now, they mentioned that in um, certain Roman sources like Cicero, they describe the stars of the Big Dipper as seven oxen, okay? However, it's, they said it's been long been known that there are eight stars in the Big Dipper if you look closely. There are two stars, Alcor and Mizar, that are close together in the Dipper's handle, okay? And so in that case, if there would actually be eight stars, these eight, quote-unquote, oxen in this particular um, pole, and it says, considered together, all these clues indicate the myth of Gefion and her four oxen from the north plowing a hole in Sweden and creating Zealand refers to a plowing that takes place in the heavens. Now, the author notes that people will object that they're talking about a real terrestrial thing, especially since he's claiming that, you know, the island of Zealand is almost a cutout that you could pick up and take from that lake. Um... And the lake actually, as, as this pointed out by the author here, is actually the size, resembles most in size and shape the outline of Lake Vanern in Sweden and not the other one uh, that was mentioned. Um, the, uh, which, which lake was it? I'm trying to remember the name now. It's, uh, let me just got to scroll up here and see what it is. Is it the Lake, uh, lake Malaren in Sweden? Okay. Couldn't, couldn't remember. I knew it started with an M, but I couldn't quite remember it. So this is, so there, what this particular author is saying is saying, yeah, you know, and, and again, regardless, you know, the, if, even if it does represent, you know, it's supposed to be some kind of explanation for a celestial event, it's not, I'm sorry, for a, a terrestrial event, that doesn't necessarily mean that it might not be replicated in the idea of a uh, celestial event. And we see this happen in mythology a lot. And in fact, we see this in, in, an, in the, another myth in um, Greek mythology, which is the myth of Callisto. And uh, that's, that's the one that I want to, um, to mention here. Callisto and Arcus, who in Greek mythology are the, great, the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, again, referring to the same exact constellation, uh, and the, except they're a big bear and the little bear. Okay, so it was, um, okay, so the story goes, let me just read you this story. Um, this is, this is, I'm just reading this from another page on the Ursa Major constellation. Ancient Greeks associated the constellation with the myth of Callisto, the beautiful nymph who had sworn a vow of chastity to the goddess Artemis. Zeus saw the nymph one day and fell in love. The two had a son and named him Arcus. Now, it's worth noting, which it doesn't say here, is that uh, Callisto did not intentionally break her vow. Zeus appeared to her in the form of her mistress, and when her mistress called to her, she ran to her, and then Zeus ravished her. That's really the way the story goes. But then Artemis banished her when she learned about her pregnancy. Now, according to this version, it says it was Hera, who was not amused by Zeus's philandering, uh, turned Callisto into a bear. Uh, most versions I have heard do not say that Hera does it, but rather, I mean, Hera is wrathful and does stuff like that, but it was Artemis herself who changed her into a bear as a punishment for breaking her vow, okay? So she is this bear, she's wandering, and her son, so her son Arcus is, is, you know, taken in and, and she roams 15 years in the forest, running and hiding from hunters, and it says, one day her son Arcus was walking in the forest and the two came face to face. At the sight of the bear, Arcus drew his spear, scared. Um, and seeing this scene from Olympus, Zeus intervened to prevent a tragedy. He sent a whirlwind that carried both Callisto and Arcus to the heavens, where he turned Arcus into the constellation um, uh, Butes the Herdsman and Callisto into Ursa Major. And another version, Arcus becomes the constellation Ursa Minor. So in other words, they're both big bear and little bear. And this only further, further infuriated Hera and she persuaded her foster parents, Oceanus and Tethys, never to let the bear bathe in the northern waters. This, according to legend, is why Ursa Major never sets below the horizon in mid-northern latitudes. Okay, in a different version, it's not Hera, but Artemis. They talk about that. Artemis does this to punish the nymph. Okay, and in some forms, many years later, Callisto and Arcus are captured in the forest, taken to King Lycion as a gift. They take refuge in the Temple of Zeus, and he saves them both by placing them in the sky. Okay. So, why do I bring this up? Well, we were just talking about the connection between Gethion and Diana. 
and one has to wonder if this why this connection is made. Because if Gethion is indeed associated with the constellation that we now think of as the Big Dipper or Ursa Major, uh, then um, you know none, then we're talking about an event that is caused or precipitated by Artemis or by Gethion that um, that creates this constellation that makes it you know makes it there in the sky. In both cases, you have a figure that is being that is associated with this uh, kind of a female virgin goddess. That's the other association that Gephion and Artemis have. Now, you, you could just point to the virginity as the reason for the association between Diana, Artemis, and, uh, and Gephion, but it's also interesting that, that there's two stories to, connected to these goddesses that are also both connected to this plowing constellation. So, um, yeah, so that, of course, that, that association doesn't prove anything. It doesn't prove that, you know, the two myths are connected or the same, because they're clearly not the same story. One has to do with a broken vow. The other has to do with, um, you know, the, the acquisition of a piece of land or the moving of a piece of land. But, um, but Gephion is very similar in her attributes to Artemis in a lot of ways. She's virginal, and it's very clear from what Odin says, that Gefiana can be potentially, uh, you know, that her wrath can be aroused. Uh, and there's also an underworld connection there, which I have noted with Artemis, uh, not only her connection to the goddess Hecate, as I see them as being mirror images of each other, uh, one in the upper world, one in the underworld, or one, I should say, one on Olympus and one in the underworld, um, but also the fact that uh, there is its very wrathful side to Artemis. And I talk about that in the Artemis podcast that I did uh, probably a couple of years ago now. But Artemis is, you know, so, you know, so Gephion does have a lot of these attributes. And so then it, it gets to the wider association of Gephion, who um, <clears throat> is a virgin, but yet mates with these titanic forces, okay, um, you know, to, to produce these oxen. So there, there's almost the suggestion here of, you know, sort of being the mother of the constellation in the same way that uh, Artemis, at least initially, is the mother of the figures who become this constellation. So um, something interesting to think about there. Uh, in terms of the, the psychological inflections, I, I, I feel like um, Gephion definitely is, is associated with uh, more primordial forces, with uh, with. The, the creation and the shaping of the world in the way that that's mentioned. And probably she has a much more significant role than this Handbook of Norse Mythology gives her credit for. Uh, it does appear that she is some kind of a divine goddess figure or at least some kind of primordial mother figure, which may be associated with um, the, you know, the, the figure of, you know, a... Um, I'm just I'm losing my train of thought. Um, I'm trying to think of who it who it was that that you know that she may be, uh, you know she she's associated with this particular um, mythology, and you know and that you know her and that her aspects that seem contradictory to people um, might actually make sense in the light of her, um, you know, ha- having these kind of complex sets of as um, of, of aspects of a deity that is sort of both celestial and chthonic at the same time in the way that I tend to think of Artemis or Diana as being. Because Diana, you know, is also associated with the moon in the nighttime, uh, as is Artemis. So there's, um, you know, there's this idea of a deity with a foot in the primordial uh, or in the underworld. Uh, oh, and I, that's what I was going to say, her aspect of being associated with Freya. Um, with who is the the love goddess and a fertility goddess, uh, also in the Norse pantheon, uh, in her aspect as being a generous giver. So, um, so there's a, quite a lot to think about here. I again, I, I want to be careful about suggesting that there's a direct parallel or that one is the other, although it's very clear that authors who have tried to translate Norse gods into Roman names made a very similar association between Gefion and Diana. Um, again, not saying that they are the same or that one came from the other, but, uh, but this curious, uh, connection with the, um, with the Big Dipper, with, with Ursa Major and its role, uh, in the stars. I mean, they're, they're not the only one. We had another story of, um, Tawaret, where, uh, Tawaret binding Seth 
uh, is also tends to be associated with that that constellation as well. So it's because it's an interesting kind of pivotal constellation. The North Star certainly was um, extremely important for navigating, and that in some ways actually almost gives it a Hecate kind of connection. The you know that that light that um, allows people to move you know to find their way in the darkness or in the unknown territory. So, um, you know, something to think about in the way that these particular female figures who are, you know, who are both virginal, but may also have a fertility quality, um, maybe celestial in some ways, but, you know, or belonging to the main pantheon of, um, of gods, but also seem to have a chthonic undercurrent, you know, her connection to the giants, for instance, and her uh, ability to you know, <clears throat> produce these, uh, these, um, these sun, oxen sun, uh, to pick up and move this land elsewhere is, uh, you know, it, it creates for an interesting and complex figure. And Norse mythology, like a lot of other mythologies, it's not, um, you, you can't just look at these things one way and say that it's just one thing or, you know, th- there's only one way to look at the story, that this goddess represents this, and they're, therefore their story is this, this, and this. Um, you know, it's like, you know, it's so, you know, and, and they can't possibly be anything else, or some, or it has to be wrong, or there has to be a right version. Uh, we tend to be very scripturally minded in the West, because we, we believe in these ideas of doctrines that um, that are written down and set in stone, and this is the truth of how it is. Of course, if anybody actually reads the Bible, they realize that that's not true about the Bible at all. The Bible is a very contradictory document in a lot of ways, especially when it comes to the nature of God. But, you know, but that putting that discussion aside, there does tend to be this, this view of um, there's one way to look at this myth or there's one way to look at this truth. And with mythology, it's just not, it's just not true. Um, you have different stories that may come from different areas, different time periods. Um, the gods may be understood in different ways. Or you may see mergings of, of different deities or forces. What we think of as, you know, not, not as gods per se, but as these kind of uh, natural forces and how they're represented in these, uh, you know, not, not only in the traditional, you know, panthe- you know pantheon that might have been, wor- you know, um, worshipped by the state or might have been, you know, part of what you might think of as the official religion or practice of a particular area, but then there's also the local practices and how those get merged in as well. And, I mean, Artemis was certainly a deity like that. I mean, there, she definitely has much older inflections and, and probably a different role and was probably merged with Hecate and with certain other deities, at least in terms of uh, function, at different points. And that you can, um, that, that's a completely different subject, completely different set of podcasts um, from me. And also, um, you know, one can look at Sarah Isles Johnson's Restless Dead to see about the way this, this sort of Artemis Hecate axis and how it, um, how it comes together. But Gethion does seem to me to fall into that, that kind of group of deity in any, any case. She has that, she has attributes that we can think of, uh, as being similar to Artemis in that sense, that connection to the Big Dipper and this idea of a virginal goddess who uh, potentially who has the potential to be wrathful, even though we don't see that happen in her stories, and then we see her having this connection to these titanic or primordial giants, um, to uh, you know to to affect this change or to make this happen uh, in the world. So there's almost the idea of her as as you know uh, being able to move the land around by by using these um, these primordial powerful forces. Um, that, you know, you might associate more closely with the underworld. So that's all I'm going to say about uh, Gefion. Uh, there's, um, you know, I, I feel like that's, you know, those are those are the main points or inferences. And, uh, you know, uh, so so it's, it's kind of fascinating to see this uh, in, in Norse mythology. And it would be interesting to know, you know, it, you know in terms of, of how stories spread we, we've talked about that but whether or not there is any kind of uh as you know if there are any way in which greek and roman myth also influenced norse norse myth in that way or whether these uh, you know these narratives grew up in entirely separate and, and unrelated contexts um that oftentimes that has a lot to do with um 
you know, language, not only languages, but flows of population. So that's a whole, that's a whole other subject. Thank you again for listening. Um, please check out Cthonia.net for all of my work, for the latest updates on new things I'm doing. Um, I do update Cthonia, the webpage, but also check out uh, on social media, Cthonia Podcast, uh, two words on Facebook, one word on Instagram and Twitter, just Cthonia on YouTube for all the latest in video, and I do update the community boards there once in a while as well. Um, there is, uh, if you would like to uh, support this, uh, the work that I do here, uh, patreon.com slash Cthonia. Um, for $5 or more a month, you do get extra episodes and extra material every month from the podcasts, uh, and sometimes podcasts on entirely different and related subjects related perhaps to things that we've discussed here. And, you know, and there's going to be um, some more benefits um, coming, you know, in, you know, certainly in 2022 and going forward. Uh, we're probably going to do some restructuring there. A lot of restructuring going on, uh, particularly at the time I'm recording this, I'm doing a whole lot of restructuring of things. So that will become evident uh, later and you'll be able to see and, and have more information. But definitely follow the social media and the blog on the Cthonia.net for the latest updates. Uh, thank you so much to my patrons who have been really wonderful and have supported me all this time. And thanks to everyone who's listening, and I'll see you in the next episode. Mm-hmm.